Okay, so what can asset management do for you? We're going to have a look at the discipline itself, the standards and the benefits of asset management. So that is what asset management can do for you. So firstly, a little piece about me. Jim's given a, a broad brush outline, but I think it's important when anybody speaks about their specific specialisms, you should know why it is that they've got that experience and why it's worth listening to them. So I've had a reasonably checkered career. I began in the world of consultancy with Ricardo Consulting Engineers, um, designing cars, motorcycles and engines. From there, I went to BOC Edwards, who are in the semiconductor industry, making high vacuum pumps. And I joined them as a reliability engineer. So after designing things, I designed new and more interesting ways of breaking things. Following BOC Edwards, I went to Metronet initially as a reliability engineer, but following the um, exit of the fleet asset manager for the Bakerloo Central, Victorian, Waterloo and City Lines, I stepped in and I oversaw the uh, retirement of the 67 tube stock and the bringing in of the 2009 tube stock. After the collapse of Metronet, I left and joined Terex as their senior reliability manager. Now they made industrial equipment. During the time that I was there, I improved the reliability of every production line and every product at all six factories, reducing their warranty claims from four and a half million dollars a month to one and a half million dollars a month. After Terex, I went back to London Underground and oversaw the introduction of the new S7 and S8 fleets, which were on the other Metronet lines, the Metropolitan District Circle, Hammersmith and City lines. And there I was poached back into consultancy by Scott Lister and have remained in consultancy ever since with Asset Right, Atkins, Sweco, Black and Beach, and now as an independent consultant. So what am I going to talk about? What can asset management do for you? In order to answer the question, we're going to have a look at the following. What is an asset? There's a definition for it. What is an asset life cycle? What is asset management itself? And what can asset management do for you? So we look at the benefits of asset management. What is the asset management standard? And what are the building blocks of an asset management system? So how would you put something together? So let's start at the beginning. What is an asset? Now there is a definition within ISO 55000, which is the outlining of the asset management discipline. And it says it's an item, thing or entity that has potential or actual value to an organization. Now, when we think of assets, we generally think of physical assets, such as what we have on the right. Okay, it's the equipment, the inventory, the property, the structures, the physical things that are owned by an organization. But it's not just that. We also have intangible, the non-physical assets, leases, brands, digital assets, licenses, intellectual property rights, the reputation and agreements with other organizations. All of these are assets. Now, brand and reputation are important, but very difficult to quantify. At London Underground, we put a value on our brand and reputation by monetizing them. A negative front page headline in the evening standard was half a million. And that cascaded down to £150 for a column mentioned towards the back of the paper if something happened that was worth reporting that was negative. So we carry on looking at the definitions that come from the standard ISO 55000. So what comprises asset, asset system and asset portfolio? This is the language used within asset management. So we looked at what an asset is. It's that thing or entity that has potential actual value to an organization. An asset system is a set of assets that, inter, that interact or interrelated. So something like a, an HVAC system where you have pumps, air handling units, filters, the power system that goes with it, the control system. That becomes an asset system. And your asset po portfolio is what is within the scope of the asset management system. And we'll look at that a little more later. So what is an asset life cycle? Well, here we have some typical examples of how asset life cycles are viewed. The top one is a very simplistic view. You create or require it. 
you operate and maintain it, and then you get rid of it at the end or replace it. And each one of these adds a little more granularity. So we're looking at the selection, the purchasing, installation, the operate and maintain, seller recycle, or down the bottom, the design construct commission, still operate and maintain, but the decommission, and then managing those residual liabilities, which might be paying for the thing to be recycled. But there is something that's missing from this. Requirements. Too often I see organisations jumping straight into creation, acquisition, selection or design without setting clear requirements. So they don't want, get what they need and they spend a decade or so working around shortfalls or trying to redevelop the asset to meet requirements that were never put in place. Requirement setting is a discipline in its own right. And it's very important to make sure you get the asset that you need to deliver your organisational objectives. And more of that later. So what is asset management itself? It's a balancing act, balancing the conflicting drivers of performance, cost and risk. In general, we look at improvements of performance and reduction in risk as costing money. There are 30 different 39 different skill sets involved in asset management. Now, these were developed by the Global Forum for Maintenance and Asset Management. And we'll look at that a little bit more later on. In terms of what asset management is, it's just good management. In the same way that reliability engineering is just good engineering. So a little more depth about what asset management really is. So here we go. Here's the definition taken from ISO 55000, which is the overview principles and terminology. The coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from assets. And we'll look at value in a little while as well. A secondary definition formed by the Institute of Asset Management says asset management translates organizations' objectives into asset-related decisions, plans, and activities using a risk-based approach. Now, this brings us to what we generally refer to as a line of sight. What are you doing to that asset and how is it delivering your organizational objectives? So again, a little bowl. There are four expansions on what asset management is. Maximizing value from beginning to end. It's putting processes in place for the operation and maintenance of physical assets, putting processes in place for the intangible assets. We talked earlier about how London Underground put a value on their brand and their reputation by looking at the column inches within the evening standard that said negative things about us. And we're looking to maximize value from the assets from beginning to end. Now, that doesn't mean until they've expired. We may sell assets on that have residual value. If you look at organizations who have fleet cars, for example, they tend to offload them after two or three years while they still have residual value. We want a through life strategy. So how are we going to develop, operate, maintain and upgrade these assets in the best possible way? And that best possible way is the best way to deliver our organizational objectives within whatever boundaries we have, financial, operational and so on. Recognizing the variety of assets that deliver value. It's not just about those physical assets, but it can be the spare parts inventory, other assets that are used across the organization, particularly in terms of computers, networks, people, the infrastructure that supports everything that we do on a site. And then managing assets through life to optimize value. We need to maintain them in a way that helps them deliver value to the organization. And determining what that value is is important. And we'll come on to that next. So. How do you deliver value from assets? Well, we need to ensure our asset management activities deliver our organization's purpose. So what constitutes value? Well, each organization will have a different view of that. And we need to develop that within our organization to say, what value can we place on 
what these assets do for us. And realization of value, it's that balancing of cost, risk and performance. And we may need to consider that over different time frames. I mentioned a little earlier that vehicle fleets tend to be passed on after two or three years. So we're looking at that resi residual value. But the majority of assets we'll have on our portfolio, we want to operate for a long period of time. Oil and gas, for example, they're looking decades. So what is the time frame for each of the assets? And how are we going to deliver value from them? And that alignment, that line of sight between what we're doing to the asset and how that delivers our organizational objectives, which deliver the organization's purpose. That's where we find real value. So we have a pyramid that builds up. And this comes from the IAM's Asset Management and Anatomy which is available to download from the IAM, and I have a link for that later on. But what we're looking at is it shows the levels from which value can be derived. And it's not usual that you get value from individual assets themselves. It's the assets that come together in terms of an asset system. And we mentioned the definition of what is an asset, what's an asset system, what's a portfolio earlier. So we look at those assets and how we maintain them, what the life cycle activities are, and how that contributes to the management of the asset systems and networks. And then we look at the portfolio in terms of return on investment, compliance and sustainability. And this is where we get up to the level of the C-suite. So they're looking at their asset portfolio. And all of this is done to support the organizational objectives and again, we talk about that line of sight showing how asset operation delivers the organizational objectives, which supports the purpose of the organization existing. And just a little note on the side about the difference between managing assets and asset management. The activities performed directly on the assets, that's managing the assets. The strategies and plans from the organization to derive value from the assets that's asset management. It's that strategic thinking. So who is involved in asset management? There's a range of people proposed here and a range of different parts of the organization. Well, that's because people do asset management. And the knowledge, competence, motivation and the teamwork have a huge influence on asset management outcomes. And within the scope of asset management, we very much look at how can we pull people together? How can we get everybody to speak in the same language, get everybody on the same page? The tools and technologies, they're great, but it's still the people who lead and drive asset management. And for asset management to really work effectively, it needs to be driven by the C-suite. You need to engage with people and explain what it is. We try to put an asset management policy, which we'll talk about in a little while, on a page. It's a simplistic description of what it is we're going to do. And that can be posted around a notice board, put up in the kitchens and so forth around the work so that people get an idea that we're an asset management organization and what that means. We need that team effort. We need everybody to understand what we're doing and collaborate. We need to break down silos between departments so that everybody is responsible for our assets and everybody is responsible for delivering value from our assets. So the scope of asset management, the Institute of Asset Management's conceptual model. Now they put this together as a simple diagram outlining, outlining six subject groups and their interactions. And you'll see that there's no one way street here. Everything talks to everything else. In the middle is the life cycle delivery, showing the acquire, operate, maintain, dispose. This is the plan, do, check, act cycle that we go through. And at the base is asset information. And I would encourage you, if you do no other part of asset management, is to get good information about your assets, about their condition, about the way they operate, the energy they use, sustainability, 
all of that information will allow you to make good decisions. Whether or not you do it within an asset management framework, you can't make good decisions without good information. I'll just highlight there the scope of asset management, deciding what's in and what's out of your asset management system. So if you have a large plant, it's possible that you're going to look at the facilities. And if you put the facilities within the asset management system, that means what's in them, such as the production equipment, that's not part of your asset management system, or at least not part of that asset management system, because usually you have different parts of the organization doing different things. So you can happily wrap an asset management system around your facilities, which is why that scope is so important. What is in and what is out? So we mentioned the six subject groups, and those six subject groups contain the 39 asset management subjects, which were developed by the Global Forum for Maintenance and Asset Management. And each one of these is a discipline in its own right. And you'll note that in amongst this is reliability engineering, number 16, group three. And there is the asset management and anatomy. That is well worth reading. There's a short link there. You will be getting a PDF of this, but you're welcome to take a quick screen grab and go and find that. It's an entertaining read, I assure you. It'll take you three and a half, four hours to go cover to cover. So there's sufficient depth to give you a real insight into what asset management is. So, what can asset management do for you? What are the benefits of implementing asset management? And I'm gonna look at a case study from Sodexo who applied this to their facilities management services. And the reason I'm using this is because it's rare for an organization to put a measurement system in place before beginning their asset management journey. So it can be hard to determine what the improvements were, but this is exactly what Sodexo did for their facilities management service line, and they made the results public. So I don't have to worry about client confidentiality. I can walk you through exactly what they did. Now, this is over 4 billion euros of facilities management. So it's a reasonably large part of the organization. This information was given out at an IM conference by Keith Harmer, their group VP. They're talking about how they demonstrated an increased benefit for the clients. So this, we come back to that purpose and how the asset management system helps them deliver that purpose and do it better. Although the information is client sensitive, there's a range of benefits for our clients. So now we can walk through those. Operational efficiency through improved asset management planning of 30%. That's not insignificant. Total cost of operation reductions are between seven and 12%, which means between 300 and 530 million euros. That's a significant saving. It took eight people three years to pull this system together and they were a fraction of that cost. Increased reliability of asset infrastructure by between 10 and 25%. Again, not insignificant. Reduced failure rates by 20%. Everybody will notice that. That is significant. Mitigation of potential risk of business interruption, a 40% reduction of risk related costs. So there are benefits throughout. And we spoke right back at the beginning about that balancing act between cost, risk and performance. But what this shows you is asset management can give you reduced cost, reduced risk and improved performance. And lastly, but not insignificantly, 100% compliance with regulations. So non-financial benefits of asset management. Well, we did mention one of those, which was the 100% compliance with regulations. Again, not insignificant if you're playing that back to your C-suite, because that will keep them out of jail. Strategic alignment of business and asset management objectives to deliver value from assets. That's that line of sight that we were talking about. What 
is that activity on that asset delivering to the business? How does it support our objectives? A clear definition of the asset purpose, the performance criteria and the data requirements. I spoke about asset information and the need for good information and what it can do for you. And by defining what the asset purpose is, this is the requirements. What do we need the asset to do? Why have we got it? How well do we need it to perform? And what information about the asset do we need to be able to understand it in terms of its performance, its condition, its longevity, and so on. Greater transparency of asset cost, condition, and performance. Well, we're measuring things better. We're getting better information. So we're better informed. Share banks practice between sites. Now I'm currently putting an asset management system in for a global pharmaceutical firm, and they have a myriad of sites across the world in multiple languages from China, which English skills are relatively low across to America, through Spain, all over Europe, Africa, etc. So there are multiple languages involved, multiple time zones, but by putting an asset management system in place and understanding what we're looking for, so clear definitions of the asset purpose, transparency of cost, now we can all start talking about what we can do to improve and what improvements we're all making individually. And each one of these sites has something they're doing well that can be shared with the other sites. So it's a quick way of improving across the board because this is within their own business. So there's nothing that the other sites can't do. They're not looking outwardly at other organizations and saying, well, we're not like that. This is within their own four walls. So anything they're doing well on one site, they can do well on another. Risk mitigation, a reduction of risk related costs. Well, we put some tangible numbers on that previously, but reducing risk is significant. And as we know, in terms of reliability, every time you improve reliability, you improve safety. The number of injuries goes down. There is a direct correlation between reliability and safety. Performance management. KPI is aligned with strategy. So again, we know what we're looking for. We know how to monitor it. We know whether we're improving. We know whether we're not improving. So we can quickly see where we're going right and quickly see where we're going wrong. Informed budget planning process. Well, now we know what we're doing. We have a thought out strategy, we have a good plan, and it's easy to do the planning. And it's the basis for maintenance strategy selection. So we know what to do. And reliability centered maintenance is one of the core parts of developing a good maintenance strategy. And the more we move towards the use of AIs and good condition monitoring equipment, the more we can do in terms of predictive and preventative maintenance, which is very hard to do without that. So what is the asset management standard? Well, we've mentioned it a few times, so let's have a little bit of a closer look. Now, there's a little bit of history because it began in 2004 with PAS 55, which was published by BSI. It was revised in 2008. Then they proposed moving on to an ISO standard, and eventually that ISO standard came in a decade after PAS 55. But there are other standards. I mentioned the Global Forum for Maintenance and Asset Management. Well, they developed the asset management landscape, and that contains the 39 subjects. One subject per page, nice and clear and nice and straightforward. And the idea was facilitate the exchange and alignment of maintenance and asset management knowledge and practices. So this has been adopted globally, which is why the IAM picked it apart and said, OK, let's collect this together. What is it that's important within asset management and develop their six box model? So these are the standards. I mentioned 55,000. We've referred to it a few times already because it gives the terminology and the definitions. ISO 55001 is the requirements, and if you are certified to ISO 55001, that means you have met those requirements. 55002 is guidelines for the application of 55001, and more recently we have 55010, which is looking at the financial and non-financial functions in asset management. 
Um, the one piece of advice I would give anybody on reading any of these is that not one of them tells you what to do or how to do it. It just says what you have to have in place. And there's a reason for that because they were all developed by volunteers and all of those volunteers were consultants. So the ISO standards are simply a way of making you go to a consultant to find out what to do. So what are the building blocks of an asset management system? What brings it all together? The asset management policy. So what is a policy? Form 55,000 again, intentions and direction of an organization as formally expressed by its top management. And we really should be prepared by the senior leadership team. It gives guidance to support decision making. It points you in the right direction. It's like an asset management mission statement. And ideally on a single page so it can be posted on those notice boards, in kitchens, corridors, wherever. And it's a statement that this is an asset management organization and what it means to the organization. And I'll leave you to read the rest yourselves. From 55,001, which is the requirements, this is what they're looking for. Appropriate to the organization, a framework for setting the asset management objectives. And those objectives need to, need to align to the purpose of the organization and sets principles for the organization to manage its assets. So if people are looking, well, what should I do with this asset? It's a quick point of reference to go back to. What does the policy say? And there are some key elements to it. So commitments to mandatory and legal requirements. Well, we looked at Sodexo, 100% compliance. Continued improvement of the asset management system. Nothing is ever perfect. And in order to achieve ISO 55001 certification, you are simply scored as competent. Three out of five will get you a certificate because you need a level of competency to be able to move on. But we are constantly trying to improve our asset management system. It talks about the resources necessary. So this is a commitment from your top management to say that they're going to give you what you need. And it looks at the decision making process, how we're reporting asset performance and the achievement of long term sustainable outcomes. So here's an example that's been anonymized of an asset management policy. OK, and it's show 12 principles are captured. Yeah. What's the purpose of the organization? Who owns the pieces of it? Compliance, we're going to ensure we have compliance. Decision alignment, how are we going to make those decisions? Stakeholders, we're going to identify who they are, both inside and outside the organization. Best practice asset management, we're going to work towards that. Asset life cycle decisions, based on assessment of expected stakeholder demand and so on. This is what it means to that particular organization. We're going to use best practice, operation and maintenance. Resourcing, a commitment to provide the resources so that you can achieve the asset management objectives. We're going to continuously improve it. And asset data, critical. We are going to make sure the asset data and information is available. And environmentally sustainable. So we look at these the next building block, the strategic asset management plan. So having got the cornerstone in the asset management policy, we develop a strategy to support it. So what is it? It is a strategic plan. What we intend to do on what timescales to deliver what results, our objectives. It sets out where you are now, where you want to be in X year's time and how you intend to get there are the tools and techniques you will introduce to enable you to deliver the strategic outcome within the time scale. So where are we now? What are our strategic objectives? And we align those to the organizational objectives. And we set the plan how to deliver the asset portfolio capability and the asset management system objectives. And what the implementation process is and the disciplines. So developing a racing matrix, looking at decision making frame, frameworks and processes for planning, prioritization, risk management and updating the SAM because they're always the best guess. The requirements, dependencies and links to detailed plan and the stamp timescale 
we recommend is two regulatory cycles. Now that's 10 years in the UK. We have quinenniums for our airports, we have control periods for our railways, and we have five year periods for the water industry and so forth. So we say you should look at least 10 years into the future. Some people go well beyond that, up to 50 years. So asset strategies. Well, now I've set policy and we have a strategic plan, we need to look at asset strategies. Now I've included this here as ISO 35000 is a little confused on this. It says the SAMP and asset strategies are the same. They are not. For each group of assets or each class of assets, we want to know how many we've got, where they are and what condition they're in. And then we develop a strategy for that asset class. Now here's a simple one. All of the units from supplier A to be replaced with low energy units from a different supplier when the cost of repair is greater than 60% of the cost of replacement. Simple, but it means everybody knows what they're doing. So if something goes wrong, you quickly tot up the cost of repairing it and say, okay, we're gonna get a new one. Simple. Vibration monitoring to be introduced every two months. Well, okay, so we have looked at the condition that will tell us if something is going to go wrong and we've determined that vibration bearing vibration or vibration of whatever else it is, belts, whatever, that is our telltale. So now we're going to introduce that. On condition maintenance, when we're going to implement it and condition assessments to be carried out and what those condition assessments give to us. A, B, C and D, where D is get rid of it straight away and C, refurbish, but only if the cost is less than 60% of replacement. So why do we go to on condition maintenance? Well, asset condition is the key measurement when it comes to efficient and effective asset maintenance. Hopefully you are all familiar with the six modes of failure. Now they were developed during the 1960s, captured in Nolan and Heaps reliability centered maintenance document in 1978. So we have known that roughly 90% of equipment fails at random for over 50 years and yet so many companies still vary out completely pointless time-based maintenance. We can also monitor and combine operational performance management and link them to an AI that will determine the best way to operate. So rather than counting the overloads that will cause degradation and lead to operational asset failure, it can eliminate those overloads. So this leads to preventative operation and preventative maintenance where degradation in performance is measured against the number of overloads to initiate an intervention. So I worked with an organization to put a system into Yorkshire Water, which was AI based. It was a control and monitoring system. As a result of implementing that system, we improved performance by 20%, reduced failures by 20% and cut the cost of maintenance by 60%. That's six zero percent. It is phenomenally efficient and effective to go down this route. So in summary, what have we had a look at? Well, we covered the following. We had a look at what an asset is. We looked at the asset life cycle and different representations of it. And I encourage you to consider requirements at the beginning of that. We looked at what asset management is. We had a quick look at what asset management can do for you. The benefits of asset management. And these were those key benefits taken from the Sodexo case study. We looked at the asset management standard and we had a look at the building blocks of an asset management system. So what is it? Asset management, it balances the conflicting drivers of cost, risk and performance, which are driven by the requirements of customers, suppliers, competitors, regulators, economic conditions and technology. Other inputs to consider are available capital, materials, equipment, facilities, resources, knowledge and time. And the result is improved business performance and reduced risk. So providing support, this is a little shameless self-promotion at the end of the presentation. So my subject matter expertise is in strategic asset management and reliability engineering. So I have a background in design, test, development, manufacturing and new product introduction. 
So that's a unique skill set, having lived and breathed every part of the asset life cycle. So requirements right through the process, all the way out to disposal and recycling, which is what we did with the London Underground fleets. So strategic mass asset management support, developing long-term strategies, developing individual asset strategies and plans, and using data and analytics to provide the insight to your assets or reliability engineering. So improving asset performance and maintenance, problem solving, a key area, failure analysis, root cause analysis, which I've done for many organizations, reliability centered maintenance, and then in terms of professional development, well, where do I sit now? I am a director and member of the IAM's UK chapter, a member of the IAM's registered asset management professional review board, which has recently been launched. So I am a registered asset management professional. I'm chairman of the IMECI Safety and Reliability Group Committee. I'm also chairman of the Engineering for Reliability Working Group, a member of their Human Factors and Reliability Working Group a member of the IMECI's Technical Strategy Board, the Policy Working Group and the Council and the IMECI's Water and Wastewater Industries Committee. So thank you very much all for listening. And Jim, do we have any questions? Yeah, Mark, that was very good. A great overview. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we have a few questions coming in here. I'm going to start with the first one there from John Coleman. Uh, and he says, uh, if asset management can provide such good cost savings, why, it, why is the uptake of ISO 55000 so low? And it may be that it's low in manufacturing. We know in regulated industries, it's a little bit higher, especially in the UK, but um, elsewhere in other industries, it's not as well undertaken or not as well uptaken. Well, it is a journey. And it's a journey that takes a while. Now, that requires significant commitment. And as I've said, it also requires it from the senior leadership team. So getting buy-in from them and the fact that they need to lead it, which is part of the assessment. If you have an ISO 55001 certification assessment, they will come in and interview your senior leadership team. And if your senior leadership team are relatively clueless, you will not pass. You cannot get certification without your SLTs, without your C-suite being bought into it, understanding it and driving it. And that, I think, is one of the things that prevents it from happening on a greater scale. Um, it's not necessary to go down the route of ISO 55001. It provides that guidance and steering. So you can implement asset management without becoming certified to ISO 55001. The global business that I'm working with now, we kicked this project off in 2017. It's going to run until 2027, but that will not include all of their facilities. It's far too large to do that. And they've decided that they will cherry pick which of the 39 subjects makes the most sense to them. So they will implement asset management, but in a way that makes sense for them, not in the way that makes sense for ISO 55001. They decided that's going a step too far for them. They'll do it at a lower scale. But within the first year of implementation on one site, we saved 6%, and that's 6% 6 out of $300 million. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Another question here from Aidan Kulnan, uh, and he asks, for existing facilities, do you recommend the use of the COBIE templates when developing an asset register? Can you advise if the use of the UniClass coding system is a key requirement when developing asset registers? I think they're specific to healthcare assets. Interestingly, the global pharma firm I'm working with has chosen OmniClass. So it really doesn't matter so long as you pick a consistent set of designations and apply them everywhere. I spoke during the presentation about getting everybody on the same page and the benefits it brings in being able to share information because everybody knows what they're talking about. So if you're using a consistent designation across your organization and across your business, then you can have sensible conversations about it with people. So I'm not wedded to any particular system. It's whatever makes most sense for people at the time. And I have colleagues who are very strong in BIM who definitely wouldn't recommend Kobe. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
And in the example that you gave us, the the pharmaceutical client that you're working with now at the moment, um, what was the, the the reason why they wanted to go down this route? What sort of kick started it? Was it one person who was an evangelist, or how did it get started? Um, well, fortunately for us, we were working with their procurement manager, uh, their compute, their what did they call him? It was above director. It was some weird designation that went with him. But he was basically in charge of purchasing. So when he was looking at what he wanted, and we were looking at the requirements and building them up. And we started talking about purpose and organizational objectives and how to tie everything together. It was, well, OK, where does all this come from? Well, this is comes from asset management. We need to determine what these assets are, what you're trying to do with them, how you're going to maintain them, how you're going to operate them, and how you're going to realize value throughout their life cycle. And he became very interested. So we took him on a little journey himself to explain what asset management was, what the discipline was. And he said, well, this is marvelous. What, what are the cost savings? So we showed him what had happened with Sodexo. And he said, if I can save 1% on one of my big sites, this is worthwhile. And that would have been $30 million. Yeah. So why would he not do this? Considering the cost of bringing in consultants up against $30 million benefit for just 1% saving, let alone the 6% that we managed. It was were, well worth what, what, were the, what were the really key areas where you made those savings? Again, this is in terms of consistency in stopping people maintaining things on a calendar basis, which is wasteful introducing condition checks simple things handheld condition monitoring so you're just going around with a vibration check or introducing actual live condition assessments so yeah. just looking at things like hvac and looking at how they were operated and saying well, why have you got these things running when there's nobody in the building why don't you ramp them down why don't you have systems in place that tell you when to turn them on and when not to turn them on so there was um, operational savings that we could make and simple maintenance savings. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose to a lot of us, they, they would seem like they're the types of things you'd expect the maintenance team to have rationalized and to optimize themselves. So if you went into, let's say, the next level up of operation where they were quite good at what they did, what type of areas would you be advising them to look at to improve their asset management we say they were good at operations and maintenance yeah again this is what are you using your assets for are they fit for purpose are you overstressing them have they been over specified and what flexibility have you got within your systems what strategies are you using to determine this what information you're actually collecting you may think you're good but are you really what do you understand about your asset base and how it's behaving and although it's a somewhat utopian vision that they're all good assets, I've never walked into an organization that hasn't got a massive backlog of maintenance that hasn't been carried out and a room with alarm boards with everything going red all over the place that they ignore. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So there's, there's some knowledge wrapped up in that that says, OK, you know when you're wasting your time because you're not doing it. Yeah. So let's formalize that. Let's put a strategy together. Let's get a better understanding so that now we can start focusing attention where it really belongs. And yeah. then we can start getting improvements. And also, what are the consequences? What are the risks? People don't look at the risk and they blindly maintain everything to the same level. It's just that, well, hold on a moment. If that asset fails, what are the consequences? Well, if the consequences are none, what are you doing? You've got an asset over there that if it goes down, it will cripple your business for two days. And you're, you're devoting the same time to both. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. So criticality is very important as well. Maintaining yep. critical critical assets more than you maintain non-critical assets, which sounds it's like right. common sense. But as we know, it's not that common um, in this industry or in this this uh, asset management field. So uh, look, a question here from Jerry Larkin is, is asset management robust and sensitive to culture variations it requires a culture of recognizing that you are an asset management organization of recognizing what it is you're doing and how it delivers your organizational objectives and supports the purpose of having that organization in place 
Mm. Again, it's this comes back to, well, why are you doing what you're doing? And we talked about cost, risk and performance. Well, as we've looked at there in terms of criticality, that helps determine what your risks are and where your risks lie. So how can we do better? Well, by yeah. recognizing that and formalizing it. And then we start to set those asset strategies, as I talked about earlier, in terms of, well, what are they? Where are they? What do we need them to do? And can we put some simple rules in place that help people make decisions? And a lot of time, the decision making is too far removed from the people who are on the ground. Yeah. So what can we actually do to empower them to make sensible decisions that are aligned to what the business is doing so everybody can get on with it? And we don't need to constantly refer up the food chain to a point where it becomes a block and we're waiting for somebody else to make a decision. In the meantime, that asset fails. Okay. And it, just in general, you spoke a little bit about information, asset information. And for me, information is the output from data, manipulation of data. Have you seen any good tools? Now, we, we probably have a lot of good data in our CMMS, but how do we translate that data into good information? Is there, is there any software out there? Have you seen anything that was very smart where they were able to take data and turn it into good information? Or are you really depending on individuals to do it themselves and create their own reports? Um, yes, I have. It's called Harvey. It's an AI. Now, an AI can sample 8,000 data points a second. And it will assimilate those 8,000 data points and decide what's going on. If it sees a glitch, it will have a look across those 8,000 data points and say, well, this thing happened. And then these other 20 things happened. The mm. next time that thing happens, it has another look. And it says, OK, this time these 16 things happened. Ten of them are the same as last time. The next time it happened, OK, well, these 12 things happened and eight of those are the same thing that happened the last three times. And bit by bit by bit, it will build a picture of these anomalies. Now, it won't understand them, but it can flag them up to you. For an individual human being to look across those 8,000 data points and try and decide what goes with what would take forever. And you can faff about with all kinds of things in terms of spreadsheets and so forth. But AIs will do so much for you. And it's that one so, you mentioned that it, it's called Harvey. I mean, wh wh where would you come across that? Is that a, is there a that's company, the, a company it's called Harvey? The, uh, it's in the water industry. It's developed by a Canadian company. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can go and Google Harvey and, and you'll find out. Okay. Yeah. But they license it and use it and so on. But that was the system that we based the um, improvements at Yorkshire Water on. And it really was. We did 71 sites of their wastewater treatment plants because they thought that was an easy way for them to start and prove out the technology without it being on the drinking water, the potable water. So if anything went wrong, it would have been less impactful than if it had gone wrong on the clean water side. So we did that with the wastewater. And as I said, we cut their maintenance bill by 60 percent whilst improving performance and reducing risk. OK. How difficult is it to get all departments on board when you when you do sit down with the C-suite? Do you really need the boss at the very top to buy in and then everybody else falls in? Or is there any tricks of the trade to convince people? It's well, again, that, that's a DEXO case study is worth its weight in gold. It, it's so rare for people to put a system in place to measure it first. Usually they get halfway through implementing it and go, oh, well, yeah, we have seen some improvements, but they can't quite hang their hat on it. But when you've got something that robust that you can put everywhere, and um, if people go and search for the ISO standards, they'll find that the ISO website actually has that case study on it in more detail. Okay. But it is so, it, it's pivotal in terms of proving to people this is what you can do. This is how well it works. Look at this major organization and everybody's heard of Sodexo. My son's um, school used Sodexo to serve lunch. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't be associated with asset management more so than catering. But I think that is changing. Certainly has yeah. changed in the last four or five years. They've become very strong in asset management, whereas before they didn't. No, indeed. And very strong in facilities asset management. We're seeing that as a real growth area. Um, because I'm, I'm embedded with the Institute of Asset Management, the majority of applicants come from a facilities management background. Okay, well, yeah, that's interesting. 
And you mentioned as well there, the, I mean, how important do you think it is to become qualified or to get a qualification in asset management? I know the IEM, they give the certificate and the diploma, which are, you know, good qualifications, but how important is it to have a qualification in asset management? It helps support your competence and learning. It's a broad discipline. There are 39 different subjects within it. I mean, we're here in terms of this being a presentation to people who are involved in reliability engineering. Well, that's one of the 39 subjects. So it shows you how much is involved within asset management. Now, we, when you're talking about managing assets in terms of the maintenance and so forth, it's a key part of that. Yeah. But we also need that line of sight and for people to buy into what are we doing in terms of replacement and spend and specifications? How are we going to manage these assets over time? So it's not just a, a narrow focus of how are we are going to maintain them? It's what are we doing around operations? Yeah. What are yeah. we going to do about replacement? How are we going to replace these, dispose of them? Are we going to maintain them to a point where they still have residual value? So we can sell off old HVAC systems before they're completely expired, yep. which is a clever way of removing the need for you to dispose of them, which might be costly. Mm. OK, so that, that seems to be all the questions that we had, Mark. Uh, just before we finish, then, what, what words of advice would you give us? Would you leave with us tonight in terms of people that are either about to start off on their asset management journey or have started to take the first few steps? What's the, what are the key things we should be looking to do? Um, well, for a start, the um, anatomy of asset management. And, I, yeah, put yeah, and I, can, I, can, I can vouch for that. I've used it myself. It's a very good document. Very good. It gives you a really, really good understanding of it. Um, do look at the qualification levels, the certificate and diploma. Um, I know they're worthwhile because I was part of the team that wrote the questions. Mm, mm. You put a few yeah. difficult ones in there. <laughs> I've done both. Yeah. Luckily, I passed <laughs> both of them. But yeah, they, they, they're, I, they're very good qualifications. And for anybody who's interested, uh, the certificate for me was actually more difficult than the diploma, which is the higher level of qualification, because I think certificate is more around the theory and knowing your definitions, whereas the diploma is really focused in on your experience and your competence. And if you're experienced and you know what you're doing, you should probably go through the diploma quicker than the certificate. Yes, indeed. Um, I worked with Nabil Shetty, although Nabil Shetty took it the other way around. He was happy enough to do the certificate, but refuses to take the diploma in case he fails. <laughs> and he wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, the standards. Yeah, yeah but in, in general, going through your asset management journey, um, if you're implementing it within organisation, one of the best ways to sell it is to say to people that you will all be talking the same way. You'll all be talking the same language. You'll all be thinking the same way. And you'll get that consistency and getting everybody to work together, that teamwork and the breaking down of silos. So you don't have organisations and department heads headbutting or trying to hold their own. You need to get everybody working together. And that's one of the mm. key benefits is everybody on the same page. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, listen, I think we'll draw to a conclusion, Mark. I'm just going to say a few final words before we finish it off. Um, and on behalf of me to Asset Management, say a big thank you to Mark for his presentation. It was very informative. Um, and I hope everybody got something out of it tonight. I, I certainly did. Um, 